go to the Lord in prayer again this morning before we begin. Dear God in heaven, truly we are grateful to you for the cross of Christ. For in that cross, in his death, all of your people have been spared your wrath. For you poured it out upon him. He took it willfully for us. Thank you. And thank you and praise you, Lord, that you have appointed a day where, like Christ, and your resurrection of Him, you will raise us up. And join our spirits to our bodies, and we will ever be in your presence, experiencing every moment of every day under your grace without the presence of sin. And as you have said, that will be fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Thank you. Bless us this morning as we examine this text from your word and give us wisdom and insight into it so that we can make application in our lives and the lives of others around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Open your Bibles, if you have not already, with me this morning to the book of Nahum. Nahum. And we will read this morning these first six verses, and I'll call your attention to verse 6, and we will back up in the text from there and examine verses 3 through 6. The Oracle of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite, a jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves his or he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers, Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken up by him. I'll call your attention to that sixth verse for a moment. Let's read it once more. Here are two questions. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? Between verses 3 and 6, God illustrates his great power. And in verse 3, as we addressed last week, we saw there that the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And now in verse 6, the other bookend to this section, Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? One of the beautiful things about this sixth verse for us is it is in a sense an explanation of the verses that have gone before us, that have come before this text. God is expressed poetically in those verses His great power, but at the same time it is poetic. It is also true, and we'll see that as we examine them. And the inevitable conclusion that those verses are to lead our minds to is stated very explicitly here in this sixth verse. 
And that is simply that no one can stand before his indignation whenever it is poured out on them. And when it is poured out on them, no one can endure his burning anger. We could truthfully say then, between verse 3 and here in verse 6, the inevitable judgment of God on the unrepentant and their inner their inability to survive it is explicitly expressed. And one of the ways that God in this context, in these prophecies here to Nineveh, chose to convey that inevitability and the inability of the wicked to withstand his judgment, the inevitability of his coming judgment, and their inability to survive his judgment whenever he comes, is that he took all of the things that he knew, that the people knew and recognized were strong and strengths to them, and he showed how those things all serve him. All of them serve him. Now, the people of Nineveh, the Assyrians, were a people like really all of us, whether we know it or not, were a people who lived close to the earth. Not in the sense that they lived on it. Obviously, we all live on it. But they recognized their closeness to the earth their dependency upon it. They ate their food from it. They built their homes from it. Their walls around the city were made from the brick and mortar that they mined from the earth. The beauty of their cities and the flowers and all of those things that they enjoyed as humans, as we do as well, they realized, came from it. As a matter of fact, unfortunately for them, and sadly because of their sin, but true because of their sin, they so admired and so were taken up with the strength of the resources that they had for their living, that instead of worshiping the Creator of those things and the earth itself, As Romans 1 says, these individuals worshipped the creation instead of the Creator. They even made their idols from it. Now, you may be thinking that today we're not like that. Well, it's easy to forget our dependence upon the things of the earth. As a matter of fact, I remember several years ago, you may have heard this same thing and seen the reports. There was a blight that was taking place with regard to cattle at various places in the United States. And they were talking about beef shortage and milk shortage and those kinds of things. And I'll never forget one of the interviews I saw with a person on television in the news. And this person's comment spoke volumes about their understanding of taking our life from the earth as far as physical life is concerned. And they made this statement. Well, if all of the cows are sick and they die, I'll get my milk from the grocery store. Interesting. Interesting. As a matter of fact, very recently, just a few weeks ago, I was watching a particular program that was dealing with the desperate condition that many of the world's farmers are in. Some because of the circumstances there in the Ukraine now and the shortage of fertilizer that's possible possibly going to impact the world and its food sources. And another person that they interviewed made the same or similar kind of statement that the woman had made. Well, if the farmers are all out of business, we still have the grocery stores. Okay. Okay. 
and then just a few days ago. You probably saw, I think it's been all over the internet now, this executive from a leading manufacturer of electric vehicles standing before a group of people on the street with the electric car plugged in talking about how wonderful it is going to be to have these electric vehicles. And as they went on to explain that and elaborate on it, someone from the people asked a question. They simply said, where is the electricity coming from? To which they replied something like this, well, it's plugged in to, the, to this particular department place here, and, and the electricity is coming from there. And then they responded by saying, well, where is that place getting their electricity? And they responded with, well, I, I think it comes from, and they mentioned a particular power company or someone there did. And then someone asked, or the same person asked, basically the follow-up question, well, where is that coming from? And inevitably, they took it back to, it's coming from fossil fuels. Interesting. We live in a day and an age today where people forget our dependency upon the natural resources of the world. Nick, there's a person at the door there. Where people forget that our lives are dependent upon these physical things. Now, ultimately, we recognize as Christians that our lives, spiritual and physical, all ultimately depend on God that they are in God's hands. And I'm going to ask you to take a look at a few verses with me to illustrate the fact that God is God over the creation. Go with me for a moment to the book of Genesis this morning, and there to the eighth chapter of Genesis. Genesis chapter 8, and turn with me to the last two verses of Genesis 8. The context of these verses is that Noah has come off the ark after spending time on there, and God has destroyed the entire world with a flood. And now Noah has offered a sacrifice, and the Bible says in verse 21, the Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to him, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. And notice verse 22 now. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. There's a lot of people running around today that are fearing climate change and they believe that inevitably there is a global warming that is due unless we change our behavior. But if you believe God, you believe His Word, God has made this statement. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, in cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. God is sovereign over all creation. Here he is dealing with the produce, he's dealing with the weather, he's dealing with the seasons, and he addresses time. All of that. And he says that he will preserve those things. It is dependent inevitably upon God. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't disruptions of those things in certain local areas. And we're going to see that this morning. But they will never all ultimately perish until God brings about the end of this earth and a new heavens and a new earth. But the point is, they are under God's sovereign control. As a matter of fact, turn while you're here to the book of Psalms and look at Psalm 74 and there to verse 17. Psalm 74 
17. You have established all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Psalm 104 is a psalm that expresses God's control, the entire psalm over all of creation, how he sustains it and sustains those who live in it. Psalm 119, 89 to 91, express the fact that creation is God's servant, that all these things, they all serve him. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, the Bible tells us that in Christ, all things hold together. Jesus Christ himself is the sustainer of all creation. Hebrews chapter 1 and there in verse 3 tells us that by the word of God, all things are held up. God is the sustainer of it. He is the creator of it. And he does with it as he will. Go back to Nahum with me for a moment. Now to chapter 1. Verse 6 once more. He's addressed the fact that creation belongs to God. And he comes to this sixth verse and he says, Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of God's anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken up by him. A summation of what he has just stated. And that is that he is sovereign over creation. And if you think that you would be able to escape his wrath, think again. Because the very things that you hold dear, the very things, he says, that are strengths to the Assyrians and to Nineveh in particular, and to that city, the very things that they would refer to as beauty and awesomeness, and as I mentioned, even from the creation they had made their idols and were worshiping, God says, I will bring your destruction. And I'll show that to you by destroying all of those things you consider strong to the extent that you can answer the question or should be able to. And that is that no one can stand before the indignation of God. No one can endure his burning anger. Move back with me in the text for just a moment. Let's go to verse 3. We saw there last week that God is slow to anger and great in power. He has withheld his immediate judgment on Nineveh, and a hundred years before this, he sent them grace and mercy and called them to repentance, and many did repent. So much so that God spared the city and the nation his judgment. But as often is the case, whenever people are spared the anger and the wrath of God, they grow insensitive to Him. And as Nineveh did, they forget Him. And they began, as again Nineveh did, to worship the creation the cre and forget the Creator. And God reminds them here that He is great in power. Power in that first He restrained His anger whenever they deserved it immediately. And power in that whenever he does express his anger, no one can escape it. No one can endure it. No one can stand before it. He moves on in the text. Notice the end of verse 3. And by the way, while this is indeed poetic, there is significant truth expressed in the fact that he is the sovereign God over the creation. The text says at the end of verse 3, And the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. The text then says, In whirlwind and storm is his way. Begins to describe God in poetic terms using the creation itself. The first thing he says is in whirlwind, that is great winds and storm is his way. 
He uses these things in the earth to accomplish his will, is one understanding of this. And another understanding is it is depicting the coming of God to the earth. And if you jump down with me for a moment to verse 5, you begin to see that mountains quake because of him and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence. The text at the end of verse 3 says, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. Growing up in Oklahoma, it was not unusual at certain times of the year, as you are aware, to see and witness tornadoes. As a matter of fact, we're blessed today that we can still examine those phenomenons from a distance through YouTube, safe and secure. But you can see the havoc and the destruction. And if you've watched those videos, you can see how the clouds start to spin. And then pretty soon, even before sometimes you see a cloud hit the ground, you look at the ground and between the upper clouds and the lower clouds, it's crystal clear. But on the ground itself, the dust is rising. And what has happened, invisible to the eye, that wind has come down and touched the ground. And once it hits the ground, it begins to pull that dirt and debris, houses and people and animals and buildings and incredible things up from the ground. That contact is destructive. That's what God is conveying here. These things that you call great and powerful in the sky, they are merely His way. As a matter of fact, whenever we think about this, I couldn't help but realize this yesterday morning, and many of you experienced some of this. Well, you all did, whether you know it or not, or knew it or not. A little after 8 o'clock yesterday morning, your house and windows and buildings around you for just a few seconds shook. And there was this incredible, awesome sound that occurred. We heard it at our house. Stacy came running and said, what, what was that? And true to my form, I thought she had done something upstairs. You know, well, what did you do? You know. Well, we found out last night, as many of you probably did, what that was. That it was a meteor that broke through the Earth's atmosphere and burned up there. It broke the sound barrier and caused what we know to be a sonic boom. And the amazing thing about that, and that sonic boom was heard from Utah clear into Idaho. The meteorite that caused that was no bigger than a basketball. That's astounding. No bigger than a basketball. Some small thing coming through the atmosphere didn't even hit the earth. But it shook the earth. How much more powerful is God? Notice as the text goes on. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. There is the destruction of both the sea, salt water, and fresh water. He dries them up. Now, this was particularly important to the Assyrians at the time, and in particular to the city of Nineveh, because around the walls of Nineveh, there was a great moat that existed. They had built a moat, and that moat prevented the enemies from crossing it to get to the what they figured were impregnable walls. God says, I dry up the sea. I dry up the rivers. It's God who does that. It's God who brings the storms upon the earth. It's God who controls the water. You think the water will protect you. I dry that up, he said. He goes on, notice the text. 
Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. You think, why is that expressed in this particular text? Well, one of the reasons is because these are the places in the world in the day that God spoke this to Assyria that held the world's splendor, its majesty, its glory, its beauty. Bashan was known for its rich pastures, grazing lands, and harvests. As a matter of fact, some have called it a kind of promised land. Then the text speaks of Carmel. And from Carmel existed vineyards. It was known for its grape vineyards in the day. And then as the text goes on, Lebanon. And Lebanon was known for its great forests. Sometimes throughout Scripture you re remember that the Bible refers to the cedars of Lebanon. And from those cedars people built homes. From those pastures their animals were fed. And from those vineyards they drank their wine. And God says that He causes it all to wither. It's in His hand. And He does with it what He will. Verse 5 says, Mountains quake because of Him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by His presence. Right now, this past week, and even today, there are people who are traveling to Iceland to see there this volcano going through an eruption cycle. God's behind that. It's a testimony that this place we know as earth and is strong and powerful is still in His hands and He does with it whatever He wills. You behold the greatness of the creation, its power, its majesty, and it itself is creation. It has a creator who supersedes it, who controls it. whom before it itself melts and trembles. The earth is upheaved by His presence. The world and all the inhabitants in it. You know, that only makes sense. If God controls the whole earth and He brings destruction to it, then whether... You recognize it or not, you're upheaved. Our lives are upheaved. Our dependency is upon God. One day, God is appointed a day of judgment. And it is interesting whenever you turn to that day of judgment, the parallels that you see here. And I'm going to ask you to do that with me for a moment. I'm going to ask you to move to the book of Revelation. There are numerous places throughout the Bible, both the Old and the New Testament, that we could examine this. But we can see it very specifically in Revelation. And whenever you turn to Revelation chapter 8, be aware of the fact that you are turning to the future. We don't know how far into the future, but this is indeed the future of the earth. It is the last days, the time that is or will exist before the return of Christ, days away from His return. In Revelation chapter 8, the judgment of the seven angels having the seven trumpets is described. You can see that in verse 6. Verse 7 says, the first sounded and there came hail and fire mixed with blood. And they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. This judgment deals with the land itself and the vegetation of the land. Notice verse 8. 
The second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. You remember from Nahum 1, we just read, where the rocks tremble before God and they break up. Where He dries up the sea. And we see it here in verse 8, that God dried it, will dry up the sea again. Look at verse 10. The third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of waters. There's a judgment there on the waters. The fresh water. You have the salt water, the sea, and the fresh waters. Verse 11. The name of the star is called Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. And then in verse 12, the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars were struck, so that a third of them would be darkened, and the day would not shine for a third of it, and the night in the same way. And here we have God's judgment in space. And what happens there affects us here. This also addresses time. Move down into the ninth chapter with me for a moment. Here is the sixth angel. Verse 13, the sixth angel sounded and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. One saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. The number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And this is how I saw in the vision the horses and those who sat on them. The riders had breastplates, the color of fire in hyacinth and of brimstone. And the heads of the horses are like heads of lions. And out of their mouths proceed fire and smoke and brimstone. Now individuals have come to these passages and they have said things like, as ridiculous as that may be, how could things like that ever happen? Remember, we are dealing with God who is sovereign over all creation. How and what are these enemies that are spoken of here, these armies? We don't know explicitly. But the fact that we do not know something does not mean it does not exist. It does not mean that it will not exist. Because we cannot bring something into our mind and get our minds around it does not excuse its existence, nor does it prevent its occurrence. Notice as the text goes on, verse 18, a third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which proceeded out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for, they, for their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. What kind of instruments these are, we do not know. Are they animals at all? We do not know for sure. It appears that they are of some kind. Verse 20, and notice this closely. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands. They have just witnessed a third of humanity wiped off the face of the earth. Hundreds of millions of people. They are living in cataclysmic times, they will be, where the sea and portions of it and Portions of fresh water will be dried up, where the land will be scorched. Not because of things just progressing over time, but because of dramatic divine intervention as God brings about His judgment. They witness all of that, and what? They still 
do not repent. And notice what he describes. The rest of mankind, in verse 20, who were not killed by these plagues and did not repent of the works of their hands so as to worship demons. Devil worship. Devil worship. And this could also be a reference to idolism, to the worship of idols. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that the things the Gentiles sacrifice to idols, they sacrifice to demons. This can be both uh, worship of devils to include the worship of idols. And the idols of gold and silver and of brass and of stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders. We know what that is. We're familiar with it, especially these days, where you're hearing consistently now across this country, because of restraints being pulled back, And whenever you pull back restraints, the only thing that fills the gap is the depravity of humanity. And so murder's on the rise. Notice as it goes on. Nor of their sorceries. Nor of their sorceries. The word sorceries here in the Greek is an interesting word. It is pharmakos. It is the same Greek word that we get our English word pharmacy from. One of the characteristics of the sorcerer in this day that John witnessed these things was to use drugs in order to reach a higher level, so they say. It's really just an expression of their depravity. We know all around us how high drug use is of all kinds, from intoxicating things such as alcohol to fentanyl, all of these things, taking the lives of thousands and thousands of people every day. Perhaps it's taken the lives of some of the people you know. The people that sell those things and participate in them do not care about anything but themselves. They say to others, we love you. They say to others, we're your friend. But then they destroy you. I just saw on the news the other evening with this youngest or young teenager missing out of California. Her so-called friend, the last word she said to her was, love you. And then she said, I didn't want to drive with her because she was more intoxicated than I. I'll find another ride somewhere else. Love you. Be safe. What a friend. What a friend. People, call it like it is. Don't be deceived. Notice as the text goes on. Nor of their immorality. The word for immorality there is the Greek word pornea. And it speaks to all kinds of of immorality. It embraces adultery. It embraces fornication. It embraces homosexuality. It embraces every aspect of immorality, sexual immorality in particular. And notice, they didn't repent of it. Nor of their thefts nor of their thefts, stealing, murdering, immorality, drug abuse, the worship of idols, 
That is the valuing of gold and silver here and brass and iron and stone and wood over and above the truth of God. And a third of mankind being killed before them. Now all these things that we have looked at this morning, all of them from God's judgment in Nahum chapter 1 on Assyria, and in particular this capital of Assyria, Nineveh, all of those things fall into the category of God's temporal judgment. That is, God's judgment wherein He causes His wrath to fall on those on the earth. But there's another aspect of God's wrath that exceeds even that. And it's what happens after these things. What happens to the soul after that temporal judgment of God falls on them. You know, some people think that this is all there is to life here, right now. The seeing and the touching, the smelling and the experience that is here today, right now. That this is it. And whenever you die, you're just gone. They have no understanding, and it's a willful rejection of reality. That there is within every person a soul, a spirit, that gives that body life. That gives that body its personality. Your personality doesn't come from your physical being. It comes from that soul within you. It comes from the Spirit. It is who you are. It's who we are. It's what enables us to think and to do, ultimately, God Himself over it. But it is that life within us. And some think that whenever they view the dead body, that is just done. As a matter of fact, some have said, and it's referred to in the Bible, eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow you die. It's all over. God doesn't see it that way, and it's not that way. He says that it's appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. And that judgment that he's referring to is not a temporal judgment. It's an eternal judgment. You see, it is only right that there is an eternal judgment. It is right that there is a temporal judgment because in this life, people do things that are against other temporal things, other people. And they will suffer at God's hand a temporal judgment. But what about sin against God? Sin against He who is holy, against the one who endures forever. It is only right that such a judgment is eternal. Otherwise, it could not fit the crime against an eternal being. Does the Bible address that? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, and interestingly enough, It was addressed most in the New Testament by the Lord Jesus Christ. He himself spoke more on the eternal judgment of God than any of the other writers. Interesting. Take a look with me at a few of these verses. Matthew chapter 8. I'll just hit a few of them with you, but notice the several that are existing here in Matthew. Matthew chapter 8, and look to verse 12. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is after they have died. This is their spirit. This is their soul that is cast into uh, 
outer darkness. And in this place, he says, there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Chapter 13 of Matthew. Move to verse 42. Matthew 13 and 42, in the context of the tares, those who are false believers that exist even in the scope of church. The text says that they will be thrown in verse 42 into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be reaping, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Move from here to verse 50, same chapter. And will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Chapter 22 of Matthew, verse 13. The king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Chapter 24, verse 51. And will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Look at Mark chapter 9. Very interesting text. You've already heard of the darkness and the fire and the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Notice Mark 9, verse 48. To the same place referred to in verse 47 as hell, verse 48 says, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That little word there is a pronoun. It's speaking of something personal to the people. This is actually a quotation from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they had places where people were thrown in God's judgment and, and their bodies decayed and the worms ate them. So the writer here, Mark, is reaching back and under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, he's conveying that final judgment that is eternal. And he says, their worm does not die. It's a place of eternal suffering and agony reserved for the unrepentant. Move with me to the book of Revelation. There to chapter 20. And in chapter 20, Move down to verse 11. Again, continuing to address the spiritual judgment of God. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. What are their deeds? The Bible is clear. In the New Testament, in the book of Romans, it says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and there's none righteous, not even one. All, the text says in Romans 3, are under sin. Look at verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. This is referred to here as the second resurrection. This is the joining of all the spirits of those who know not God with their resurrected bodies. And together they will be cast into the lake of fire. Verse 15, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown 
into the lake of fire. This is also referred to as the second death. It's a death that is the judgment of God for eternity. There is more than just this life. There is an eternity out there. Don't think for a moment because you can't see it with the physical eye. Don't think for a moment that because you can't perceive it with the physical brain that it doesn't exist. There are a multitude of things historically that we have not been able to see or understand and we have come to realize today that they exist. And there are things like that occurring every day. But for those who are believers, you know it's there. You don't know because you can feel it. You don't know because you can see it with your eye. The Bible makes that clear. 1 Corinthians, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for those who love him. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But God has given to his people his spirit. And in that great gift, they are also recipients of another gift, faith. And that faith is in the word of God and rests solely on his word. Wherein he gives us the revelation of these incomprehensible things, heaven, and also even the magnitude of his judgment. And for all who hear of God's judgment, and for all who recognize that they are sinners and deserve His just judgment, there is a Savior from God's wrath, the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, and we'll not cover the verse this morning, but Lord willing, we will next week. When you come to Nahum chapter 1, Verse 7, you come to that great truth of God's grace. The text says, the Lord is good. He is good. His justice and His wrath, as severe as it is, it is good. It is good to judge sin. It is good to judge crime. It is good to judge criminals. And it is good when we consider the great grace and mercy of God. He poured it out on Nineveh at one point in time. He gave them that opportunity to repent under the preaching of Jonah, and they did. But so long after that, a hundred years later approximately, the descendants of those who had believed God subjected themselves to their sin. They explored the depths of their depravity. And whenever you do that, inevitably you will meet the wrath of God. It is inevitable. And you will have no ability to survive it if you meet it. The only hope is in Jesus Christ. And for that reason, the Bible says, repent and believe the gospel. Stand with me this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for today, for your great grace and mercy. Thank you for your provisions for us. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your wrath. Cause us all, Lord, to tremble in your presence and cause your people to rejoice in the midst of your goodness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise the Lord indeed for our greatest blessing, the blessing of salvation in Jesus Christ. Wow. Solved there our greatest problem. Praise the Lord. It's a blessing to see all of you today.